Um, now, um, we will have a presentation by Doug Logan. Boat Sense, Lessons and Yarns from the Marine Rights Writer's Life of Folk. Doug has been managing ed editor, technical editor, executive editor of Sailing World, webmaster of Cruising World. <laughs> and editor of Power Boat in many other positions. And Doug has written hundreds of articles about boats. Doug lives in Stony Creek. Please welcome Doug Logan. Thank you. Doug, your turn. Thank you, Bob. And, uh, and many thanks to Mary Lou. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Uh, Mary Leary in the, in the Stony Creek Museum. I, I'm still getting a ton of feedback. Mm -hmm. I think if everyone just make sure to uh, turn off their microphone if you're not actively presenting, that would probably help out a little bit. Okay. Right. Oh, oh, that's. I think that's better. Thank you very much. Again, thanks to the Stony Creek Museum. It's been a little tough to give book talks during a pandemic, and uh, Zoom Zooms come in pretty handy a few times. Um, uh, I, I want to talk about the book, uh, Boat Sense, um, but I have to give a little, in order to tell you what it's about, I have to do a little background. Um, probably like most of the people here in this Zoom meeting, I, I grew up uh, around here. I, I was a water rat in the Thimble Islands forever and uh, uh, from when I started sailing, uh, sailing a little styrofoam boat when I was about seven and I rode around the islands and I swam around the islands and, and um, the water uh, just became compelling to me from a very young age and, uh, and I know it, it did for a lot of you too. Um, I, I worked summers uh, in high school and college at Bruce and Johnson's marina I, uh, I i did a more more and more sailing and more boating all over the place a little bit more serious and then uh, i went to new york uh, as a book publisher in the late 1970s and uh and i discovered that life in an apartment wasn't wasn't quite what i was hoping for so i ended up living on a boat a very used sailboat at City Island in the Bronx for, for almost three years. And that, um, that was an adventure. I, I, I commuted downtown uh, to uh, 29th Street in Manhattan from Pelham Bay. And uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of yarns that come from that, but that's not for tonight. I, uh, I then uh, became managing editor of what's now Sailing World in, uh, you know, I think it was 1985, and that started this about 34-year career uh, in uh, in writing about boats and boat gear for a number of different publications. And uh, I was 14 years or so with Sailing World and Cruising World, and um, and I had a ton of adventures and great time, and and uh, made lots of friends who I still have, um, but. One, I, I, I noticed along the way that um, there was a sort of a disconnect between uh, the way sailing was advertised in, in the Glossy magazine and the way it, it really was. And anybody who spent any time on the water uh, and, and read the magazines knows what I'm talking about, that the ads every day is bright and sunny and uh, there are vases of flowers standing on the saloon table, perfectly varnished saloon table, and everybody's rich and gorgeous, and the kids are always happy, and, and the engine always works, and it's easy to get in and out of a slip. It's a piece of cake, no problem. And I'm thinking the whole time, hey, wait a minute, that's just, that's not right. It was, you know. From a marketing point of view, I, I'm sure it was right. And in fact, when I went to argue against, uh, not against, but I, I, th I thought maybe it would be good to advertise some of the challenges of the sport and, and, uh, and the, what I thought were the deeper pleasures of the sport. 
And uh, that, yeah, of course, that doesn't fly from a marketing point of view, but somewhere along the line, I, uh, I sort of decided that my role was not going to be to try to sell boats, but to try to, uh, to try to help people who were already had boats who were wrestling with boats to, to get along better with them. And of course, meanwhile, the boating industry is selling tons of plastic boats that will never go away. And, and uh, uh, people are finding out that owning and, and running a boat is, is very different from what they saw in the ads. And uh, the boats, a lot of the boats stayed at the dock and, uh, and you couldn't get slips for the boats. And, and the whole way along, this, the industry, the boat building industry is trying to make it, make it look easier. Uh, so after about 14 years there, I, I, I got seconded by these magazines to do, to, to, to do a sort of collaboration with a big internet company. Um, this is this is the dot com first dot com boom in the late 1990s. So I went back to New York, and um, well, you know what happened to the dot com boom. The first one, with the exception of a few companies like Amazon and Google, uh, every a lot of stuff, three quarters of it just went up in smoke. And and uh, one day I was sitting at my desk, and it, it, what what we were doing didn't have much to do with boats anymore. I found myself surfing the, the infant internet for uh, links on mascara. And I thought, yeah, I gotta think I gotta get back to the water. So just then, um, serendipitously, I got offered um, a job as, uh, of, of, as editor of Practical Sailor. And, and for me, that's that's the that's the brass ring in in my in, in that business that I was in. I, I always loved the magazine, um, so I went there. And, and for those of you who don't know it, it's it's uh, kind of like the Consumer Reports of the maritime trades. It's subscriber driven, doesn't take advertising, and so we could we could pretty much say what we thought about a boat or or a piece of gear, and we had a ton of fun testing things. We, drop things from ladders and hit them with hammers and, and made them leak and left them in the sun to bake and left them underwater. And I, some of you probably saw some of the experiments right? we did out in the thimbles with you know, chain and paint and rope and all sorts of stuff. The thimbles waters are really, really good for growing things uh, on underwater objects. But in a practical sailor, I had a um, I had a little soapbox at the front of each you know, the issue each month, and and what I what I usually did there was to try to tell a story or say something useful about one of the pieces of gear that we were talking about in that issue, um, whether it was bottom paint or rope or chart plotters, or whatever. And the idea was to try to connect those things with bigger ideas to, to, to make the thing more readable and also sort of more interesting. And, um, and then my last, sorry to keep doing this, but it all ties into what I'm getting at. Uh, then I went back uh, years later for my last seven years uh, to a, a web 2.0 thing. And, and that was uh, working with a wonderful team of my old friends. Uh, editors, Sorry. Um, uh, to produce content for a bunch of voting websites that were owned by a conglomerate. And, and it was wonderful because the conglomerate didn't know anything about boats and just let us do what we wanted. And, uh, and we, we cranked out a, a ton of pretty good content. And, uh, and then the conglomerate sold to somebody else and that was it. They broke the team up and, and I thought, well, maybe I should try to do a book. And, uh, and I thought, what, what kind of book, what's worth saying after 34 years of doing this? And a lot of what I wrote over the years was pretty topical. You know, here's a new boat. Here's a piece of gear. Here's a test of five pieces of gear. Here's a feature about an ocean race uh, and 
a lot of them were what you could call evergreen, that the pieces were things that would stand the test of time, and just be, not just be, not because they weren't topical. But there were too many of those, and they were too varied, and I, and I, I, I couldn't figure out a way to put them under one cover. And there were already plenty of good technical books and how-to books out there. And also, that looked like a lot of work. So I started looking at what I had available and I, I focused on, what I ended up doing was focusing on pieces that I thought would make sense to mariners, boat people a long time ago, 200 years ago. And that, and that would also make sense to them if there are boats 200 years from now. And I wanted to try to get down to things that were, I don't want to call them universal truths, but something like that for, for boats. And that, that eliminated a lot of material. And it's a small book. It's, I don't know if I mentioned, it's, it's like 120 pages, but it took a lot of work to make the book that small um, to, by trimming everything down. And I also wanted the the material uh, uh, to be useful for newcomers. So I wanted pe people who knew boats to say, yeah, that, that makes sense. And people who are new to boats to, to, to give them a, an idea of, of um, what, the, what it was really about and not to scare them, and, uh, but to say, look, if you bear with this, this game, um, and, and, and do some do some work, do some studying, you're going to get so much more out of it than what you're seeing in the ads with everything going perfectly. Um, so, that, so that's uh, what, what came of it is the, that Venn diagram got smaller and smaller and, and uh, it, I ended up with a sort of this little compendium or uh, Nat Philbrick was nice, to, he called it a treatise and maybe Maybe that's what it is. Uh, and it's these, these are collected from um, Sailing World, Cruising World, Practical Sailor, the latest bunch of uh, web writings. They're kind of hopefully woven together in a thoughtful way. And, um, um, and they, there are some sidebars that are, I call them technical sidebars, but even those are meant to be um, nuts and bolts that uh, that would appeal to both professionals and newcomers. So basic, basic ideas. Um, and there are two central ideas in the, in the book. One is that, uh, that sailing and boating are basically an exercise in chaos management. <laughs> All of life is like that, obviously, but, uh, but in boats, it gets more concentrated. And, uh, and you, you just think of, of how it works. You've got this thick fluid here bouncing around and, you, and you've got a thin fluid here flowing over fluid A and there's this messy interface. And then you try to take a, a vessel and, and push it through this, these elements. And, and at that place where everything meets, it's, it is chaotic. It's partly predictable and it's partly chaotic. And, um, a lot of what we do is figuring out how to manage these things. And there, sometimes it's macro chaotic, like big waves, big wind. And sometimes it's micro, like things growing on the bottom of the boat. The second you put a boat in the water, uh, things start growing on the bottom and uh, the sun bakes it and, 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 the, and the gulls use it for, for their terrible depredations and, and I mean, plastic things turn brittle and break and, and so on. And, uh, and all of this chaos is, is a fact of life in boats. And you really have to learn to love it. You have to learn uh, to love the times, obviously, when things are running smoothly. And, and then the times you're, you're fixing something that broke when things aren't going smoothly. And then the times you're shoring, shoring something up ahead of time so that next time things will go smoothly again. And they're, they're all parts of the, the same experience. And uh, that was something I couldn't always express in my days of commercial uh, magazine work um, or web work. 
but I, I could at Practical Sailor and I could in this book. So, so that's, that's thing one. And the second central idea is that um, skills, skills and habits are more valuable than, than tools and labor-saving devices. Um, and this too is a concept that works pretty well on land. And in the long run, you end up really valuing forethought, good habits, good systems, good management, but also flexibility, adaptability, awareness of things that are happening, things that might happen. And uh, there are certainly times when I may go overboard with simplicity, even to the point of being willing to undergo a little bit of discomfort to preserve it. And I do understand that a person's love of simplicity might be taken by a sign uh, that, or by, as a sign that the person is, is lazy or unclever or, or parsimonious. This is water off a duck's back. Simplicity speaks for itself. I rest my case. Uh, these bits and pieces all go under the, the, the title boat sense because I think it describes, I hope it describes a state of mind more than anything else. It's, it's a state of mind that most people who've spent a lot of time around boats understand and, and, and they eventually develop this sense. Uh, and I think it's something that people who are new to boats should be encouraged to develop. Part of it, it obviously involves seamanship and, and, and boat handling skills and marlin spike skills. Um, but I wanted to talk about the state of mind. So this is one reason it's, it's not a big book. It's, it sticks to this, these ideas. So I'd like to read you a little passage uh, from the opening of a chapter called Walking the Bee. It's about seamanship. Ingrained habits of seamanship are lighter, simpler, cheaper, and more reliable than gizmos sold to mitigate the consequences of inattention. Imagine what it's like for city police as they walk their beat. Check the beauty parlor window to see if Dan is hassling Doreen. See if the Thompson kids are in the alley. Touch the grip of the pistol. Listen for the poker game on the second floor of the hardware store. Note the out-of-state license at the parking meter. Identify the sources of smells, gasoline, burnt rubber, weed smoke, donuts. Adjust the squelch. What's true for beat cops in the city is also true for sailors. It's the habits of seamanship, the things you check constantly or have checked constantly for so long that awareness of them is almost subconscious, that are the most important elements of a safe and contented life afloat. These habits are born of a constant low-grade paranoia that comes from having met Murphy many times. It's not always visible to the casual observer, except maybe as a kind of restlessness. Well, the casual observer may simply be enjoying the day with the water hissing by and the sun sparkling, our closet paranoiac is quietly walking the beat, noticing the sheet tension and lead position, thinking about what ports and hatches are open, listening for sounds that are right and sounds that are wrong, watching the weather, coiling, cleaning, restowing, always planning the next move and planning what to do if that move doesn't work out. If the engine's running, she's checking the gauges. And in case a gauge is wrong, she's looking over the transom now and then to make sure cooling water is issuing forth. The going is boisterous. He's lifting the bilge covers for a look once in a while and making sure things are stowed right so they won't come flying across the cabin. She's checking the gas valves, the head seacock. He's making sure the heavy air jib is on top of the pile, that the boat hook is lashed securely, that the life sling can be deployed without a snarl that no one's sitting to lure of the traveler car. There are no technical means of avoiding the beat, not in the long run. There are sensors, but no array of sensors can match habitual human watchfulness. Okay. 
going back to what I said earlier about the ad agencies and marketing people always trying to make voting look easier. Uh, here are a few snippets from a chapter called Embrace the Hacksaw. If you want real lasting enjoyment as a boat owner, you'll need to get there by one of three paths. One, bring a good set of skills ranging from fiberglass maintenance to engine mechanics. Two, have a lot of friends and mentors with those skills and be a good student. Or three, arrive rich. But even if you arrive rich and pay others to do the work, you'll still be better off getting your own hands dirty. Because if you can't learn to love hacksawing in a cramped space with skin coming off your knuckles at every stroke and sweat pouring from your brow, you cannot really love voting as much as it can be loved. This is the sad truth about those who pay others to do the work. They're missing much of the fun because running a boat that you maintain yourself is a whole lot more enjoyable than running one that has been maintained by someone else's concentration, effort, dedication, and understanding. When experienced boat people hang around together, they discuss hacksaws and hoes a lot more than they talk about the supermodels they've had lounging around the cockpit, as in the ads. Although I'm sure that would be everybody's preference. They talk about alternators and epoxy and stuffing boxes and exhaust elbows and sea strainers and joker valves. If you don't know what a joker valve is, Picture the lips on someone giving you the raspberry, but what's coming through the lips of the joker valve isn't air. It's a lot worse than air. And another thing, a lot of the fun in boating has to do with the stories you collect, and you can't have a good collection of stories without some maintenance adventures. But maintenance yarns are really boring if you don't do your own work. We were in the middle of the channel and the engine died. We got a tow in. Then I called my mechanic. Is that a good story? No, that's a boring story. But I could tell you a story about changing a joker valve while heeled over offshore in rough weather that would make you laugh and cry and throw up all at the same time. Entropy rules the universe and it's the nature of all things to break. Thanks to the environment they operate in, it's the nature of boats to break more often and in less convenient places. It's the end of this chapter, I think, or the end of this subsection. Life aboard boats is definitely beautiful, but rarely in the ways shown in the ads. And it's definitely fun, but it's not always easy, especially when you're new to it. And it's not usually very comfortable. And a lot of the beauty comes from it not being so easy. It takes hard work and setbacks. But if you stick with it, those things yield rewards that are much better than what the glossy ads can ever show. Rewards like skills, understanding, and self-reliance, which are handy both on and off the boat. And easier in boats, uh, it, it also often means a lot more expensive and, 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 uh, and, and certain to demand a lot, uh, a lot of your attention. And there's, I think, at least an argument, at least is good for using your attention uh, to take in what's around you and, and, and not what, not necessarily what's on your, your, your new chart, chart plotter with the radar overlay and the AIS overlay and, and the wiring and all of that. There, and here's a little, one last little yarn. It's about um, uh, Sally Pinchel. And um, I think probably a bunch of you knew Sally Pinchot. She, she and Giff lived, lived in Guilford and um, uh, they had a, uh, a great boat named Loon who, who had moorings. Uh, she had moorings uh, north, of, uh, north of Cotton Two and also uh, uh, to the east of Bear. And I got to sail on the boat a fair amount. It was a great privilege to sail with them. And, um, so here's just a little, a little snippet. The best coastwise pilot I've sailed with was Sally Pinchot, now gone. 
On one delivery we made an all day run under power along the coast of Maine in fog so thick we could barely see 30 yards. She piloted with speed time distance arithmetic, vector triangles, depth contours, current charts, and timing echoes off nearby islands. She also piloted by the smell of spruce, the sound of waves on shore, and particularly with the aid of a stack of notebooks she had kept for many years while sailing those waters. She'd call up from the nav table. In four or five minutes, we should come into a string of lobster pot floats that are yellow with green stripes. Tell me what you think of the tide when we go by. Sure enough, the floats would show up on cue and we'd give her the bearing and, and set of the current and she'd tell us to carry on or change course a few, a few degrees. And she and Giff used the old fashioned um, compass, uh, compass references. She'd say, steer south, southwest, half by south, make four knots through the water. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and I don't mean to say this is how navigation should be. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a curmudgeon or a Luddite. I, I totally love technology and, and this is in no way a condemnation of chart plotters or modern cartography. I, I would be dumb not to use those things, but for people just coming into the game, I wish there were, they were a way they could know the, the pleasure of, of figuring their way around with a paper chart and parallel rules and a, and a good compass and, and a, you know, Casio watch. It, it, it's, um, when you take a hand in, in piloting, uh, you, you orient yourself, you orient, you're orienting yourself, you're plotting your own course and you get a pleasure from it. There's a more intimate connection with your surroundings when you're taking bearings and, and, and making sure of things uh, that you're seeing in the chart. And uh, so it's it's more fun. And uh, I, again, I don't I don't want to sound like a luddite, but I I hate to see people not being able to to do, to access that kind of um, that kind of skill and pleasure without going through, without sort of bucking the tide, so to speak. And and again, these are. And navigation, piloting skills, the ability to orient yourself and use a compass. And again, you can, it's good. It's good on land too. Uh, I do understand that boats are, are different things to different people, and um, uh, so I, I I'm not trying to be categorical in any way. I, I think some people love boats as tinkering platforms. Some people. Uh, some people use them as second homes and they put them in the slip and they've got a place on the water and the boats never go out and and uh, and that's legit if that's what makes you happy that's that's fine to me um a boat is is a friend um uh, that can take me out into the wonders so to speak and to, to see the sights and a, and a good boat is a partner um, in, in navigating and, and, and handling that chaos, uh, but you know, both the, the micro and the, and the macro, the, uh, the mindset of boat sense, um, that seamanship, the foresight, the adaptability, the flexibility is, is, uh, is what lets you be in a state of readiness. And I, and I don't mean readiness for contingency, although that's part of it. I mean, the readiness to, to get out of your, get your head out of the cockpit and, and see what's around you and, and spend time doing the thing that you're there to do with the people you want to do it with and to learn as much as you can about what you're looking at and what you're moving through. Uh, so that's, that's it. That's the book. And, um, um, I should say that it's available in bookstores, luckily, and it's uh, it's available in Stony Creek at Seaside, which is the um, which is the little shop next to the market, and I'll 
I'll see if I can share a screen. And let's see here. Yeah, this is, um, I, can, I can't, I have no, no response because everybody's muted, but I'm hoping that I'm sharing a screen of, the, of a picture of the book's cover. Looks good. Then, Looks okay. Good. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> and then um, I should also say uh, I have a new share of a of a blog that goes along with the book. I say it goes along with the book. I don't update it all that often. That can is that visible now? This is uh, other pieces that. Um, they're not in the book. Some of them are old and some of them are new. Uh, but uh, for more recent things, like the top piece in it now is um, is called Sweat Perspective in a Bitcoin World. Uh, so there's just some extra reading there if, if, if you like to see it. If uh, Actually, I can. here's what I'll do. I'll stop sharing there and I'll put, um, you get the chat thing open and I'll just put the link to this keyboard up here and see if yeah that showed up so that's the blog and, and the blog has pathways to the book uh, it's available uh, on amazon as you can see and um it's there's also a kindle edition if you like ebooks um and uh, that's that's it for my presentation um it, it, should i look and see if there are if there are uh, any quick questions or QA and um, do people want to unmute and ask questions or, uh, or Hey Doug, John Dracos here. Hey John. Hey Doug, I, I love what you had to say about old school navigation. And I, I wonder if you have ever heard of two essential navigational tools that one must have on board. One is a sack of potatoes and the other one is a pig. So the idea <laughs> is if you're ghosting along in the fog, you position somebody up in the bow with a sack of potatoes and they throw them out. And if they hear a splash, they're fine. If they don't, well, they have to uh, alter course. So as for the pig, <laughs> Again, if, if you're hopelessly lost, apparently if you throw a pig overboard, it will always swim north. Is that right? I didn't well, know I haven't that. tested it. But you know, you know, John, John, you got to test that for me. I will. I'll do that for you for, for, your, for the sequel to your book. Excellent. Thanks. You bet. Take care, Doug. Thanks, John. I'm not sure where to get the pig. <laughs> Hey, Doug, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, Mary Lee. Yep. Hi. Yeah, I put a question in the chat. Um, please share the story with everyone about um, you and Melissa in the tornado on your boat. Oh yeah. Well, that, that was a cautionary tale. I, I, um, I, you know, if you go to the blog, maybe the best way is for if people are interested in seeing a short video of that microburst that hit. Uh, I've lost track. It was summer before this past one um, that came through Brantford. It was a, ser a series of microbursts and or a tornado or two. Uh, Melissa and I happened to be anchored out in Pup. And uh, we had, we had uh, already heard the reports that there was going to be severe weather. So we, we canceled it. We were going to cruise to the east and we decided to bag that. We were hanging around in the thimbles and saw this thing coming on radar on our phones and uh it was too late to get back to Brantford and it was coming from the northwest west northwest so we 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 had a good place to anchor and um in the mud um right on the line of um uh, the Guilford Brantford line and it was about four feet deep with good mud and, and we carry ridiculously big ground tackle on that boat so put that down and and we made it through, but it was uh, it blew I think eighty or ninety knots and knocked down a ton of a ton of trees in Brantford. It cut a swath right right through the place. And so anyway, there's a blog. There's a video of it, which uh, 
I, I strung together from Melissa's videos. I was busy. I, we were running in gear, trying to stay behind the anchor road. And uh, Melissa took videos, and I cut out all of our swear words, so it's 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 G-rated. <laughs> Uh, but it was pretty exciting, and I know. I mean, probably everybody in this in this uh, chat experienced something in that. And if you were in town, it was pretty wild. It's in the blog. There's the video, and there's a story of it in that blog. Did you see the? Did you see the question or the the? Can you put the the link to the blog in the chat? Oh, I think I thought I just had, but maybe I can do it again here. Um, didn't show up, Doug. Oh, yeah, did, we don't have did, it. did that not show up? Oh, maybe I'm sending it direct to Peter Van Loon. That's what I'm doing. Okay. So it's a send to everybody. A try, no, that didn't work either. Uh, I don't like, I don't want to get rid of Peter Van Loon. Oh, who can see this here? Recording it. Let's see. Host to everyone. Right. That come through? Yes. yes. Okay, so that'll get you to the top of the blog. Uh, and then, and I think that story is about four, four, um, four blogs down, four pieces down. And, and while you're at it, Fr Frank Bolin is here. And, um, and uh, the second story uses Frank as a kind of a, I, I think the second one is about uh, some ocean racing, distance racing we did uh, the last few years. And, Frank is featured, so he's a he's the model. He's a right. he's a prototype. He's a prototypical model for this. Yeah, but consider the source. Consider That's true. The source. That's true. Shady. Yeah. You know, Doug, you're talking about navigation, and I'm reminded of a time that we were up in Nova Scotia, um, and we uh, got talking with a with a fisherman. Um, and he'd been fishing most of his life and he was giving us a tour around town. And um, he said, you know, uh, it's really something what all this electronics has done to me. You know, for 35 years or so, I went out in pea soup fog with the compass and the, and the watch and sort of ran my trap line. And about 15 years ago, I, I started picking up Loran and onto GPS and uh, and I was out the other day in a skiff and the fog rolled in. I didn't have the foggiest idea, no pun intended, where yeah. the hell I was. You, you, you really get, um, it, it's very important, I think, to remember that things break. Both yeah. you and I have been out and had our GPS and all our chart plotters and stuff, a little bit of a lightning here and there, it does a wonder to your electronics, yeah. uh, fail. The systems fail. And being able to handle the boat with a compass, an echo sounder, and a good reading chart, have your paper charts on board. It gets to be very important. Yeah, and and, and it, you remember what how unpleasant it is to be lost in the fog. A very unpleasant sensation, especially if yeah. there's at least shorter rocks around. Right. Not not to mention the danger, right? No, this is Ted Ells here. Hey, um, Ted. Hi, how are you? Can you tell me what, what your favorite boat that you owned uh, was? And if you don't want to pick out a boat, can you tell me? And, and also tell me why. If you don't want to pick out a boat, can you tell me about all your boats that you owned? I haven't owned that many boats, Ted. But luckily, each boat uh, served the purpose during its, during its tenure. It served the right purpose. But the boat we've had for 18 years prop is a... I think it's it's become part of the family, and and uh, it's a, it's a motorboat, it's a single diesel, uh, and Melissa and I have run it all over the place and had a wonderful time in it. For sailboats, <clears throat> I don't think you can beat a laser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a pure that's just pure pleasure. But and anything more than that is. Is it has to be uh, it's this matter of systems and design, and some of them are, are great. But I don't know, I'd be hard pressed to pick a favorite. There have been many wonderful boats, though. I do enjoy having your boat out in front of our house in the, in the uh, summer. <laughs> Thanks, Ted.
it's not, nice. it's nice to see you from there. <laughs> that's 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 also the uh, petroleum war was the same same boat, wasn't it? It's the same hull. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's an old port twenty six hull, and and the guy who built mine was uh, named Hans Zimmer. He was the shipwright at, at Pilot's Point. He built it for himself, yeah. and and he was so good that I've been really reluctant to do. I mean, I think nine times before I drill a hole anywhere in that boat because he he had it pretty well figured out. But over the years, I've gotten a little more bold. Does anybody else have any questions? This is Mary Lee from the Stoner Creek Museum. Does anyone have any questions of Doug? I think you've got to get his book. I mean, <laughs> my husband just couldn't put it down. And, um, you know, it's it, like like Doug did, su did such a great job of editing, and like he said, he's like the Hemingway of boat of uh, boat books. <laughs> I didn't say it's, that. It's, oh, Andy um, said it. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, does anyone else have any other questions? I, I've got a question. Can you hear me? Hi, Charlie. Hey, Doug. How are you? Fine. Listen, is there a way we can get this? Uh, your, your presentation tonight can you put this on your blog and i'm i'm asking because i think i i found it really entertaining but i'm really thinking for charles oh sure well i think mary lee uh, or bob correct me if i'm wrong but i think they're the blackstone is going to put yes. it on a video. Yes, that, that's yes. correct it'll be on the blackstone youtube page the whole the whole presentation oh, okay well so charlie as soon as i see it i'll, I'll send you the link okay or I can send it. I don't have Charles's address, but I can. Well, uh, thanks. Yeah, I'll uh, send it to you. He's in the air tonight, unfortunately. So he, uh, you know, we couldn't ask him to uh, be watching this yeah. as we're as, as we have. And Teresa just said she posted yeah. a link to Facebook. So if you look at the event page for this event on our museum, on the Stony Creek Museum Facebook page, I posted the link to the blog there too. Okay. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you very Thank much. You, Teresa. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, I can't thank Doug enough. Um, and just oh, did Charlie have a question? Yeah. I anyway, I don't know. I don't want to stop the questions, but I just want to thank right now uh, Doug and um, the Blackstone Library um, just so much on behalf of the Stony Creek Museum. But keep going if you have questions. Did yeah. Charlie have I don't have any more questions. I'm just trying to get rid of my picture here. <laughs> Hi, so, Janet. Hi. Hi, Doug. So, there we go. So am I on there or not? You're on. Yes, you are. Oh, okay. yes, you, are. you were so handsome, Charlie. Oh. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I have a okay. Well, I've got a short story to tell. Um, uh, and it relates to Doug saying that um, uh, People and smarts and skills and that sort of thing are more important than gear. And we uh, had one experience. We were coming up to the finish off of, it was from 1BI up to uh, Block Island of the Bell. And as, as always happens, it blows up. And I think we were already down to a number two jib and we had reefed the main and we were still on our ear and we were still probably a mile short of the finish when the um, the fitting on the main traveler broke. And so the main came basically was flogging itself to death. And we were still quite a ways from the finish. And um, Douglas figured the best thing to do was just to walk aft, sit down on the lazarette and grab the damn thing and hang on to it until something could be done. <laughs> and and he did that for quite a while <laughs> before we got stuff in control. But it was a, he he was better than a piece of gear. <laughs> was, that, was that on the dolphin, Kim? Or, or yeah, that was on Sevilli. That was on the dolphin. <laughs> yeah, so, so you can imagine it. It's it's blowing, and you're in a dolphin, and you're half swamped anyway. And <laughs> yeah. We we're trying to hold off Sam Fisk and Andy Anderson and a whole yeah. bunch of predators behind us. Yeah. <laughs> so is that Doug relying on his smarts? 
<laughs> that was the dumbs. <laughs> uh, Doug, there's another question in the chat. Can you see it there? What do you think about the resurgence of celestial navigation recently? Uh, I I love the idea, and I've and um, I've uh, watched some um, really good YouTube uh, videos on it. I'm I'm ashamed to say that I. I would. I need them. I, I haven't tried it for so long. I know Frank Bolin is a is a master navigator, master celestial navigator. Maybe I ought to take lessons with Ted. But there are uh, a, a lot of uh, valuable YouTube videos to get to get you started if you're interested right. yourself, and right. um, and and good instruction. They, I know they do it at Mystic, uh, and in general, I I think it's it's a wonderful thing because it. It's another example of, of uh, a valuable skill that orients you in, in the entire world, and in this case, the celestial world. So it's, it's not just about boats. It's about, in this case, the heavens and, uh, and uh, a little bit of geometry, trigonometry, uh, some, a little bit of math. And in this case, uh, you do have access to instruments uh, that are, I mean, I think you, I don't know, but I'm sure you, there are celestial nav apps for the iPhone or for, or for, for smartphones now. So that's a good way to mix uh, old, ancient understanding and wisdom with modern technology in, in a pretty wholesome way. And Frank, you, you could probably speak to this a lot better than I could. No, I think you said it all, Doug. That's very, very well said. The, um... I don't know about resurgence, if I would class this as resurgence. There's always been a group of aficionados that have um, practiced. Um, and there's been, you know, the Marian Bermuda was uh, celestial, pretty much all celestial for quite a while. And then they mixed it up a little bit. But the resurgence that might be of interest is it's from our government. Yeah. The, US, the US Navy and the Naval Academy for a few number of years, uh, did away with celestial navigation. And on the order of five, seven years ago, they brought it back, recognizing that things do break and there might even be some strategic effort to yeah. dismember your GFS, GPS system. That's right. David uh, Collar just, just typed that in the chat, chat. He says that the Navy just started teaching it again. That's a wonderful yeah. thing. And you're right, Frank. I mean, you have two, at least two, two main GPS systems. The Russians have one, we have the other. And yeah, so uh, it becomes a strategic decision. Yeah. Right. And a lot of fun, you said it right. You, you do begin to think, and I know everybody has, what would happen if the constellation was compromised and, and, you know, there are people flying in the air, pilots who would, I think, be uh, helpless, trouble. pretty much helpless. Uh, and uh, large ship navigators and, and uh, as drivers, you know, trying to find their way to the nearest stop and shop. So you know, it would be a big deal if, if, that, uh, if that came down. Awesome. Okay, so um, this goes way too fast, Doug. Um, and for all of us on here, uh, we just want to thank you so much. And well, thank you, Mary Lee. Um, I just want to stress get get Doug's book um, <laughs> available at Seaside on Amazon, um, at Breakwater, um, and RJ Julia. And again, Doug, thank you so much for being part of our annual meeting. You're just it was outstanding <laughs> and. Um, you know, look for, we're, we're, we're continuing the speaker series. We've just had such great success with it. Thanks. It was really Ted L's idea. Um, and the Blackstone Library has been excellent sending it around. And um, the nice thing about this now, once you get the, um, the link, you can forward it to all your friends and family and everybody out of state and out of the country, and they can all see this and they can all buy Doug's book. <laughs> thank you very much, Mary Lee, and thank you very much, Stony Creek Museum and, and Blackstone Library, and, and thanks everybody for coming. It was great to see. So there's all friends, so so I appreciate it so much. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Doug. Okay, bye bye, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.
a nice meeting. All right.